my goodness, the finish of the night, and it was insane. So the Knicks and the Pistons. Pistons trying to avoid the worst record ever. Knicks, of course, in a serious playoff chase. We're in the final minute. Pistons down by one. Here comes Quentin Grimes. That's up and good. So Detroit has a one-point lead. The Knicks get the ball. Our man Mike Green is at the mic. And watch the madness that ensues. Brunson, three-pointer. Off the mark. Rebound deflected. Chased down. Saved by Grimes to Fontecchio. Knocked away. Hardenstein picks it up. Out to DiVincenzo. Ten seconds to go. He throws it away. Ball loose. Picked up by Brunson. Brunson inside the heart. Hearts banks it in. So unbelievably, the official who was standing right there misses the rugby tackle by Dante DiVincenzo, and then they call that, and so the Knicks wind up winning on that bucket. Monty Williams enraged, and he has every reason to be. We'll play you everything he said after the game. Where's the New York media now? The absolute worst call of the season. No call. And enough's enough. We've, we've done it the right way. <clears throat> we've called the league. We've sent in clips. We're sick of hearing the same stuff over and over again. We had a chance to win the game, <clears throat> and the guy dove into Asar's legs, and there was a no call. That, that's an abomination. You cannot miss that in an NBA game, period. And I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of our guys asking me, what more can we do, coach? That situation is exhibit A to what we've been dealing with all season long, and enough's enough. You cannot dive into a guy's legs in a big time game like that and there be a no call. It's ridiculous and we're tired of it. We just want a fair game called, period. And I got nothing else to say. We want a fair game and that was not fair. I'm done. So that's what he said. Afterwards, the crew chief, James Williams, acknowledged that he's right. Quote, upon postgame review, we determined that Thompson gets to the ball first and then was deprived of the opportunity to gain possession of the ball. Therefore, a loose ball foul should have been whistled on New York's Dante DiVincenzo. That, of course, is, from a Detroit perspective, too little, too late. Here's Wendy. What are we supposed to say this morning, Brian Winhorst? Monty Williams is absolutely correct. It's impossible to make a no call there. The referee, and it was the crew chief, James Williams, the most veteran referee on this crew, who is indeed standing on top of the play. It's a clear loose ball foul. Um, it's an interesting moment of karma if you're a Knicks fan because you remember, Drini, two weeks ago, that game in Houston where there was a foul on uh, called on Jalen Brunson right at the end of the game that the yeah. officials in that game admitted was an error directly after that. Um, and that cost them that game. In this case, the exact opposite happens. There's no call made, and this basically wins them the game. Now, you may ask yourself, why can't the NBA officials review this call? And the answer is because there was no whistle blown. There was no stoppage of play. There was no call to overturn. You can't overturn a call that was never made. In the case of the Brunson call two weeks ago, that call could have been overturned, but Tom Thibodeau had already used his coach's challenge. It's an imperfect system, and unfortunately, the NBA has had a couple of very bad mistakes at the end of games here where they've admitted immediately that there was an error and then it cost the team the game. And, and as far as the frustration from the Detroit side, I, I just think it's worth reminding everyone why, despite the fact that they're nowhere near a playoff chase, why these wins might mean so much to them. Yeah, they're sitting on eight wins, and, and they've made changes to their roster. I assume that at some point they'll get two more wins, but they are not out of the woods yet on the worst ever record, which is 76ers back in 72-73, nine wins. They've got eight. They've lost six in a row now, and I'm just going to point out they lost 28 in a row earlier this season. So, yeah, in addition to just being real angry, they're really trying to dodge this history, and this obviously situation doesn't help them in that. No. Uh, just remarkable. And so, again, to finish it up, there was there's probably not a whole lot that can be said or done more than us just saying it and doing it. Everyone sees it, and the call is missed. Wendy, we'll have a lot more from you. There's a bunch of other NBA to get into, so stay close by. But NBA 
acknowledged it. The crew chief, who was actually the, the, the official who was closest to the play, acknowledged that they missed the call. So what are the right things to say now, the morning after it happens? Well, this is the second time in the last two or so weeks that there's been a call at the end of the game that has been dead wrong, that the league and the officials have admitted are dead wrong, that's involved the Knicks. Remember a couple of weeks ago in Houston, Jalen Brunson gets called for a foul at the end of the game. It was a very controversial call. Again, a scramble play out near midcourt. This game, it cost the Knicks the game. In, in, the, in the game last night, Jalen Brunson on the other side, he gets the loose ball on a no call. Now, you may ask yourself, how come this play is not reviewable with all the things they review in the NBA? And the answer, Greeny, is that they didn't blow the whistle. If there's no call, there's nothing to reverse. So in this case, there's nothing that they can even look at. In the case of the Brunson call, that was reviewable in Houston, but Tom Thibodeau had already used his challenge. And, and I think it's just worth pointing out, we all understand where the Knicks are right now. If they get Julius Randle back healthy, they're, they're competing for a high seed and maybe a deep playoff run. But you say to yourself, why are the Pistons so upset? They're having such a difficult season that the opportunity to win any game is incredibly important to them. Yes, this is not a tanking team. This is a team that is trying to avoid infamy. They still have only eight wins. The, the worst of all time is the 72, 73, 76ers who had nine wins. They've now lost six in a row. And I know they're in February and they have plenty of time. But remember, this team lost 28 games early, in a row earlier this season. And so any game that the Pistons lose right now is them getting closer to history, which they are desperately trying to avoid. And we know this because they have made a number of trades to improve this roster and not bought any of those players out. They are trying to win. This was bitter for them because they were several of their players were traded off the Knicks. Uh, including Quentin Grimes, who thought he might have had the winning basket a few moments before this, and they end up with a very, very bitter loss, and there's nothing you can say except for the NBA and the referees screwed up. Yeah, I mean, mistakes happen, and that was clearly one that went a long way towards deciding the game. Went a little bit of a, a complicated place. Our Jonathan Gavoni released his first 2025 mock draft for the NBA yesterday, and, and the noteworthy name in this, of course, is USC's Bronny James, that's LeBron's son, and Gavoni is projecting him to go in the second round of the 2025 draft. At one point, he was projected as a 2024 lottery pick. So LeBron went on Twitter shortly after this. He has subsequently deleted this tweet, but he tweeted, can y'all please just let the kid be a kid and enjoy college basketball? The work and results will ultimately do the talking no matter what he decides to do. If y'all don't know, he doesn't care what a mock draft says, he just works earned and not given. Again, LeBron has subsequently taken that tweet down. Brian Winhorst, again, you've known LeBron since he was a teenager. This is such a complicated area. I get so uncomfortable talking about things like this when we're, when we're dealing with someone and their son. We understand all of the dynamics involved. What, what is the right reaction to have to all this? Well, I think Jonathan Gavoni, whose track record of uh, projecting prospects is golden, I think he's being very fair, and he's not the only one who feels this way. Scouts feel this way. John Hollinger at The Athletic, a former NBA uh, executive, wrote something similar about a week or so ago. Um, just let's be fair from LeBron's perspective, too. I agree with him that Bronny James is definitely a hard worker and definitely should be given some space. But also, we don't know what Bronny wants. He has never done an interview since being at USC. He never did an interview in high school. We were only left with what his father says, which he's made clear repeatedly about his desire to have his son with him in the NBA. And that's what we're reacting to here. And the other thing is, yes, he is a college freshman. and Let him have the college experience. He also is projected to have the most NIL money of any college athlete this year in excess of $6 million. So let's not also pretend like he is not extremely high profile. The bottom line to all of this, right now he is not an NBA level player. That doesn't mean that he won't be in the future, which is what Gavoni's ranking reflects. And, and, and all of that... Aside, as you mentioned, LeBron has talked about wanting to play with him and all the rest of that. So what should we be thinking with the Lakers having the season they're having right now? What should we be thinking about LeBron's future? Yeah, let me just say a couple things about the Lakers. Regardless of what happens this season, and they're still in the thick of it for sure, they still are in position to make a major move this summer. And they also, LeBron can opt out of his contract this summer, which I think he will do, Greeny, for two reasons. One, he can get a multi-year contract, 
uh, that averages 50 plus million dollars a year. Regardless of how long he wants to play, I think he's going to want to do that. And this is important. He doesn't have a no trade clause right now, which is why all of a sudden there was this, you know, this chatter about him at the trade deadline. If he opts out of his contract and signs a new one, even if it's just for two years, he can install a no trade clause to get that out of the way. So I expect regardless of Bronny, regardless of the Lakers finish, it's probable he'll opt out of that contract, even if it's just to re-sign with the Lakers.